My name is Mark Murphy of Commonsware. I'm an independent developer advocate uh, focusing on Android. You might know me from a seemingly endless number of books that I have been writing about Android app development, uh, and that leads spanning back 10 years. You might know me from 21,000 and some odd answers out on Stack Overflow for Android development. You might know me from previous DevFest DCs, Android Summits, and other stuff I've done here in the DC area. But today, I'm talking about scoped storage. Uh, QBeta 1 came out you know, a little over three months ago, um, and one of the things that popped up in there was this scoped storage set of changes, uh, and at the end, my reaction was kind of a little like that, um, because I wasn't surprised about it. I had been expecting these changes coming for some time now, but I was expecting that we'd get a little more warning, because particularly back then, the story was, oh, well, and the changes that are coming, not only are they drastic, but they are going to affect all apps regardless of target SDK version. And so everybody would have to adapt all of their apps here by the end of the summer because, you know, as soon as Q would ship, you know, maybe in the August, September-ish time frame, now all of a sudden we're going to have users who are going to be affected by these changes. Now, eh, we've then gone through QBeta 2, and they changed the story around scope storage. And we then had QBeta 3, and they changed the story again. QBeta 4 came out like last week. They changed the story again. The good news is that the story has gotten simpler, uh, and that the, it's uh, much more straightforward what the changes are. Uh, and they've done some stuff in order to make those changes a bit more graceful. On the other hand, this is from I having to keep updating books and slides and whatnot, and that because they keep changing the story on me. But you're getting the latest and greatest stuff, and some of that is that this is really going to talk a little bit about our next year's release, because as we'll see, you're going to be able to get out of these changes for now, um, and that the but you are likely going to be forced into them for next year, and so uh, and that so. While you can play with these changes now uh, and that the, in order to get your apps ready, you're not going to be forced to have them ready until sometime in 2020. While Google introduced this stuff, they never really talked a whole lot about why um, and that they haven't really given any sort of rationale for these uh, changes and that the but, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who are all too aware of exactly why this has been going down and that why we have been changing the way things have been working with external and removable storage over the past decade. In the end, with any given app, the user typically wants to allow that app to access a file or maybe a directory of files, or maybe a category of files, like a music player being able to access music files. And that's pretty much it. The problem is that what the user winds up doing is that to give access to one thing, they have to give access to everything, all of external storage and removable storage, well, lesser extent on that, but all of external storage becomes available to those apps, and that, that if the app has requested read external storage or write external storage, and the user grants it, that app has full reign over the external storage. Privacy and security advocates have been railing against this for years and years, um, and that particularly because they contrast it with you know, iPhone and that where individual apps can't really mess with other app stuff. So I'm told I, I, I don't do much with fruit flavored operating systems. Um, and that the, occasionally Blackberry, but, um, and that, but the, it's, um, and so they've got a much tighter model here in terms of what apps are gonna be able to do with other apps data. And everybody has been saying, hey, why can't Android do that? If you've been doing Android development for a while, uh, and that the you'll know that the story around our storage access rights have changed over the years. Way back in the beginning, 2008, 2009 timeframe, no permissions were needed to work with external storage. Everybody could do everything they wanted with it. It, you know, Garden of Eden sort of environment, and then the snake showed up. Uh, and so in Android 1.5, they added write external storage as a permission. You had to request that permission in order to be able to write to the external storage area. 
They then introduced a read external storage. It was a little weird. They added it to the SDK, didn't enforce it for a while. But eventually, Android 4.4 came around, and since then, up until this year, the storage rules have been relatively stable. If you've been using methods on context to find where to read and write on external storage, methods like get external files dir, get external cache dir, you haven't needed any permissions for those, but if you want to work elsewhere, you want to call methods like get external storage public directory on environment on that or work with arbitrary paths, now you're going to need read external storage and or write external storage depending upon what you're asking. And so we've had this sort of stable set of rules for a while. There are a lot of Android developers where this is the only story they've ever known. That's changing. The good news is you still do not need any permissions to work with the locations provided by context. Get external files during that, no permissions, read, write, do whatever you want. And as a bonus, you no longer need any permissions to work with those locations provided by the environment class. Guys, you just can't get to those anymore. Those methods are now deprecated. If you attempt to read and write arbitrary locations on external storage, nothing works. You have no access. This has caused angst. Uh, and that the among certain developers who look at this and say, bah! How am I supposed to cope with this? And that's what we're going to get into here today. Um, and that they, because this is quite the sea change, um, and that they, from what we've had previously. Now, again, if you're only using internal storage, you're working with room databases, shared preferences, get files, dir, get cache, dir, that sort of stuff. What the SDK refers to as internal storage, you've never needed any permissions for that. There's no changes to there in addition to no changes to get external files, dir, and so forth. And as I mentioned, you can opt out. You can have Android request legacy external storage true on the application element in your manifest to say, no, I don't want this change. Give me the old world. In which case, for Android Q, your app will continue to have the classic approach to external storage, same with Android 9.0. But Google has indicated that R is not going to honor this. And so by next year's major release, you're going to be forced into this new scope storage realm where you no longer have access to arbitrary spots on external storage. And so you can experiment with this in Q. You can say, OK, I want to specifically opt out of the external storage and maybe a build type or product flavor and be able to see how your app behaves and be able to adjust it. But by next year, you need to have switched over to doing other things. If you don't like that, it, at least it's a simple story. Uh, previous releases. They used what they called sandbox external storage. Earlier queue betas, you looked like you had full read-write access to external storage, but that's because each app had its own little sandbox area. Each app had its own independent portion of external storage. Uh, that was slick in terms of it wouldn't break anything from an app standpoint, but from a user standpoint, this sucked. This basically meant that apps uh, and that they could no longer work with the real external storage, the user would have to realize, oh, I have to go into Android and then Sandbox and then find the app amongst the list of all the apps that have stuff out there, click on that, go into, into there, and that would be the Sandbox for that individual app where its files would be written to. That didn't fly, and so they switched to this new approach uh, and that of saying, okay, there's just no access to external storage outside of app-specific locations. Beta 1 had this role system. Beta 1 and 2, you had specific permissions based off of file type, like, you know, there's a read music permission, and they got rid of all that, too. Um, and, that the, and so the story is simple. The story is painful, uh, and that, the, that if you're working with external storage and it's not one of those app-specific directories, it simply will not work. But we got that flag. We can put in the manifest to say, don't do this to us for Q, and, that the, and so 
first, you're going to probably want to add that flag, you know, maybe after this presentation uh, and that they get that going into you know, your pipeline and that the because Q is going to ship here again, probably August, September ish time frame to existing pixel users and you know, other devices over the next several years. Um, and that the end, so you're going to have users who are going to be getting the new version. You want to make sure that you are handling it today, but then you want to be spending the time to back away from external storage, use other things, and that's so that next year when R ships that you are ready, do not wait until R beta one to decide, oh yeah, gee, we're gonna have to, have to now deal with this. Um, and that the start working on it now, get it into the pipeline, get the, you know, get the JIRA tickets and y'all, you know the story. Uh, and that the don't wait till the very end. So what are you supposed to use? If you are looking for a piece of content, you want to work with a file. You're using mostly the storage access framework. You'll use intent actions like action open document or action create document. These are not that hard to use. It is simple start activity for result stuff on that you create the intent, you say, oh, okay, I, this is the MIME type of what I'm looking to open, or this is the specific MIME type of what I'm looking to create. You know, add the openable category so that you actually get something that you can work with, because that should be by default, but you know, they didn't ask me. Uh, and that the uh, call start activity for result, and that the, the user then gets, in the case of action open document, they get a screen where they can go browse their app. Looks like the Files app on modern versions of Android. And that it's a file open dialog. Users have been using this in desktop operating systems for decades. Create document will be more like file save as, where they can go in and say where they want to create the file and that they give it a file name and so forth. You then get control back in on activity result on that the, if you get result okay, your intent will have a URI in it. And that URI, you can then turn around and work with Content Resolver. You can get a Content Resolver from any handy context, call open input stream on passing in that URI, you get an input stream. Looks a whole lot like a file input stream. It's just not for a file, strictly speaking. And so you can write stuff out to it, uh, and that the, whether you're using Kotlin extension functions, or you're wrapping things in buffered writers, or you know whatever you feel like doing. Same thing for output. You're gonna be able to, if I can get to where I want, I hate trackpads. Uh, and that the, you can call open output stream on your content resolver. Get an output stream in order to be able to go write content to the location specified by the URI. And so, you use those methods, and that I think you use those intent actions, you use content resolver, there's document file, which is a wrapper you can put around one of these URIs to give you an API that looks a little bit like javaio.file for being able to you know, get the display name of the file, get its length, things like that. It looks similar to file.io, it's not the same as file.io, but should be a relatively simple conversion. You can do things like respond to action view or action send intents, and that you may have code for that already. That's not strictly speaking going to change. You get some URI from the other app, you turn around and you typically will use that with Content Resolver in order to be able to work with it. You're welcome to tell the user, hey, just put your stuff in my app specific directories. This requires the user to then navigate into Android data, your application ID, you know, files and drop stuff in there. And so it's not the most user-friendly solution in the world, but it's manageable. It's at least an option. And this, of course, isn't necessarily going to be smooth for everything. You may not get a URI that you can both read and write. There's no way in Action Open Document to say, hey, I intend to write to this thing. Can I please get something that's writable? Usually it'll be writable, but not always. In particular, if the user chooses like the audio category and browses through there, uh, we tend to get URIs from the media store that are not writable. Uh, and so hopefully we will get that addressed in a future version of Android. 
when you get the URI in, you can work with it, and you can like pass it around to other components in your process, pass it to another activity, pass it to another service, and so forth. If you add the flags to the intent, they'll be able to write to it, but you don't automatically have durable access. Think of the URI as being like a session limited URL to a web service, and that the once that session times out, you gotta re-authenticate. Same thing here. You'll have short-term access to that content, but you can't just like write the URI to a file and assume you're gonna be able to read from that URI again tomorrow. There's ways you can ask for it. You can call to take persistible URI permission on a, um, con on a content resolver and try to get durable permission. Depending on where the URI came from, that may or may not work. And this is still not really a file. If you can work with streams, if you can work with file descriptor objects, you're in good shape. If you're working with some third-party library or even a few spots in the Android SDK, which expects a file object or a file system path string, you're out of luck. Uh, and that the, you're gonna need to either switch to some other library or switch to some other portion of the SDK or worst case scenario, copy the bytes from the input stream that you open to some local file that you control, just as you might download something from a website and that the and be able to work with your local copy as a true file, because you won't be able to get a file from an arbitrary other location. There's also some developers out there who have been cheating for a few years. Android 7.0 basically banned file URIs. If you try URI from file and you put that URI into an intent like action view and you try starting that activity, you crash with a file URI exposed exception. The right solution was for you to use things like file provider and provide a content URI in those intents. Not, not every Android developer takes no for an answer, and so some developers have hacked strict mode to say, yeah, I still want to allow file intents to go out. That's cool, but those intents aren't going to work on Q. You can't, I mean, the, as the sender, you can't assume that the recipient is going to be able to read that file. They may not have access to it if they're operating under scope storage rules. Conversely, if you are the one who is advertising that you're supporting action view, you may need to consider maybe not supporting file. Um, and that the, you might say, oh, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I've got an intent where I'm supporting action view, and I'm gonna support the HTTPS and content schemes for uh, plain text MIME types. I'm also gonna support action view for file URI using an activity alias to say, oh, okay, uh, really, these intents should also route to that same activity, but I'm only going to conditionally enable that, specifically blocking it on Q and higher, so that I don't accidentally wind up getting a file URI that I then can't use. And that making sure that, okay, I simply don't show up as an option for the user, um, and that the four rogue apps that are continuing to use file URIs, even though they shouldn't, Maybe you need to work with what we would classically consider to be a file system directory, what the storage access framework work refers to as a document tree. There is action open document tree as an intent action. You can go in, say, all right, I wanna open this tree, uh, I wanna open a tree, the user gets the equivalent of a desktop operating system select directory dialog. They go in, you know, find a particular tree, and that the, you get a URI back, you wrap that in a document file, that's gonna have methods like list files. You can turn around and use that to traverse the tree hierarchy to get at all the content that's there and to create new documents inside of that tree. You're welcome, of course, to have the user work with your app-specific external or removable storage directories. You got the UX problem that I mentioned earlier, but it's at least available. Yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of your options. And that if you need a whole tree's worth of content, these are your two main ways of going about that. Either get the tree from the storage access framework or you're stuck forcing the user to work in your app specific directories, even though those may not be the easiest for the user to find. 
Bear in mind that while Action Open Document and Action Create Document usually will work with cloud storage providers like Google Drive, Action Open Document Tree for some reason doesn't. I haven't quite traced down why this isn't behaving the way I would expect. Uh, and, that the, and so while you might be able to use cloud storage providers for single documents, for trees, it's fairly likely you're going to wind up uh, limited to the user's onboard flash. Also bear in mind that as we are working with these document trees, that there's a whole bunch of inter-process communication, IPC, that's going on. If I call list files on a document file that's wrapped around one of these tree URIs, I, can, I get back a list of URIs representing the children. But what that winds up doing is there's an IPC call from my app to a core OS process that makes another IPC call into the document provider, whoever it is that's providing this tree, and then it's flowing back into your app. And if you are going to turn around and going to iterate over that list of files and be able to ask each one of them, you know, hey, what's your display name so I can show them a recycler view or something, if there's n of those, now you're making end calls and getting in responses, and that is relatively slow. Uh, some benchmarks put it at like 100 times slower than the equivalent direct file system access. This is what caused a lot of file manager developers to um, have that emoji that I showed you earlier, uh, and that they were there unhappy with all this because it really slows things down. Once again, the documents you wind up either opening or creating in this tree, you're going to be limited to streams, file descriptors. You do not have file objects that you can pass to an arbitrary library. If you're focused more on media, you're writing an audio player or an you know, an audiobook player or a you know a, a video player or something along those lines, and that the you can still use media store. You know, query uh, as you have historically, um, and that the in order to be able to go in and you'll find what's out there, and you can use insert on a content resolver in order to be able to say I want to add content to the media store. The media store will place it in external storage in an appropriate spot. And so the it is um, the good news is that these this content is durable. The stuff that you put in get external files dir and get external cache dir, when your app gets uninstalled, all that content goes poof. Stuff you put out in the media store, that's owned by the user. Uh, and you're going to be, and the, they will survive an uninstall. And so if it's content that is media and really it's the user's content, it's the photos they're taking with your camera app, you're going to want to insert it into the media store. Q adds a few things in order to help us with this. There's a new relative path option that we can use to say, all right, I want to suggest where this should get stored. I don't want it to just get stored in like the pictures directory. I want to have a, you know, an open camera directory under the DSIM directory because that's where people are used to finding their digital photos, something like that. Is pending, you can say, oh, okay, I want to insert content, but really what insert does is it just allocates some space for you and gives you a URI back. You still have to open an output stream and write the content to that location. Is pending, you can do that on the initial insert to say, all right, I, I'm going to be inserting this content, hang on a moment, and once the content is written out, you can turn around and say that, all right, it's, um, it's ready now, and flip the is pending to false in order to be able to make that content visible to other apps. By default, other apps won't be able to see your pending content. That way they won't wind up accidentally trying to work with partial, uh, partially written out content. Oh, I'm having a wonderful day. Well, so much for the slides and demos. Um, and that is my system seems to have somewhat frozen. Uh, so we'll do the rest of this a cappella. Um, and that the, so um, uh, pretend that I was showing you some code uh, and that the for uh, working with the media store. The, um, there's going to be some apps though that are really, really, really hosed by these changes. 
I mentioned file managers earlier. Uh, the leading people and that the, who are railing against these changes are the people who write your file managers uh, and that the because uh, they are now strictly limited to working with the storage access framework. And as I mentioned, it's slow. It doesn't have nearly as much information um, as they can get from the file system and so on. Apps that are using things like file, I mean, file observer. I mean, you've been monitoring this directory for changes and automatically reacting as soon as a file shows up there. Yeah, well, file observer, it kind of needs files. Uh, and that the end, it, you know, you're not gonna be able to do that unless you have the user work with your app specific directories. If you're working with code that needs random access to content, such as SQLite, um, and that the working with SQLite databases by default, those are on internal storage, you've got file system access to it. App-specific directories, you can still work with SQLite. But for arbitrary locations on external storage, all you're getting is a stream. You can't create a SQLite database off of a stream because it needs to be able to do arbitrary operations. It needs to be able to read, write, transactions, all that stuff. That's not gonna be available. Similarly, some sorts of media players may have problems with some of the streams that we get back from the storage access framework because they can't rewind nearly as easily unless they do their own buffering and stuff. And so it is, uh, there's going to be apps that are going to be basically just really in trouble. Those sorts of apps, you need to be starting like now um, and that they are figuring out how you're going to cope with this world. How are you going to work around it? How are you going to get things to behave uh, at least well enough that your app can still survive once R ships. Again, do not wait. Um, and that the if all you're gonna do is say, oh yeah, this is interesting, and then go to sleep, and that the until R beta one next March, now you're gonna be behind the eight ball again, um, and that the, the way we would have been here back in the spring. So Start thinking about this now, and that the start adapting your apps to the storage access framework, media store, et cetera, and that the use resources, and that the, uh, and that the you know, presentations like this, Stack Overflow and the like, in order to get the help that you need. Questions? Whoa, you people need caffeine. Did they not serve stuff out there? I thought they had things, I thought I saw like cases of, of like Pepsi and that showing up. Is that a question in the back? Sure, just in case uh, and you couldn't hear that. Basically, the question is, is there other stuff that makes me go, ah, um, and that be regarding Android Q. Um, in terms of regression type stuff, uh, if you've been working with location data, there's a bunch of privacy related changes to that. Uh, you've got to do a little bit, things a little bit different if you're going to be uh, getting location data in the background. Um, and that whether it may be that you start in the foreground, but then the user may be moves to another app, you fall into the background, but you still need location access, like say a navigation app, or apps that need to have background location, you know, from the get-go, and that the uh, employee trackers and wonderful things like that, uh, you're gonna have to have some changes. If you've been querying the media store in order to be able to get at location data for like photos, uh, and that the, that's redacted by default, you've gotta do different things in order to be able to access that stuff. Um, the, uh, if there are, if you have been starting activities from the background, that doesn't work on Q anymore, uh, and that the, you cannot call start activity, uh, and that the, from say, like in response to a, a broadcast or something along those lines. Uh, so if you've been like working on, you receive FCM push messages, and then you start an activity in response, that's no longer allowed. You can, you'll use a full screen notification or something like that instead. Um, those are kind of some of the highlights uh, and that the, there's a, uh, a variety of other uh, smaller changes. I've got blog posts and that the Ivory Q and other uh, beta release, I do a random musings blog post that outlines the things that I want you to worry about uh, and that the, uh, and so uh, check out commonsware.com slash blog uh, and that the, and look for the random musings posts and I'll have some other tips in there. Question here. 
the, uh, the compatibility um, side of this? And, and is it uh, something that like Android X is going to pick up for backwards uh, support? The question is the com compatibility and backward support. Well, the good news is, is that pretty much everything that you're supposed to be using, we've had for years. Storage Access Framework, Action Open Document and Action Create Document, they debuted with Android 4.4. Action Open Document Tree debuted with Android 5.1. We've had those for a long time. So, so long as your min SDK version isn't crazy old, um, and that the uh, you can uh, switch to those and that and not have much problem. Similarly, a lot of media uh, store stuff, and that has not changed. Some of the insert rules, and that they are a little bit different, um, and that the um, I I've hinted that there ought to be a storage X, um, and that library, and that that tries to hide some of these complexities, uh, and that the uh, I am not sure whether you, uh, and that is going to take me up on that one, um, and that so, uh, and I've got no particular insights into the minds of Google on uh, that, so I can't you know, tell you whether anything's in the pipeline uh, and that the, so um, uh, you shouldn't be needing a whole lot and with luck, what little we need, uh, somebody will create whether it's Google or a third party. Yes, in fact, there's, uh, there's a QR code, uh, like right there, uh, I will uh, see me afterwards. I can get you the URL uh, to it, uh, uh, and that the uh, uh, tinyurl.com slash dcdevfest2019, I think, works all lowercase, um, uh, and that the, uh, sorry, devfest DC, capital DC, 2019, uh, and that the, uh, but otherwise see me afterwards, and that the, and I can get you the URL, uh, and that the, I don't know why my system froze up here. It's almost like my last name is Murphy. Okay, and we are out of time, uh, and that the, so uh, thank you all for attending, uh, and that the, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.